So really what we're looking for is we're looking to see both teams, but mostly Defiant, just because they're the ones with most control, trying to set up these dives onto the back line. And again, it's not going to be something that we see them hard commit to. We're only really going to see them hard commit to that if they get like a really nice slam or if they have the ults that let them do it, right? Um, so obviously this isn't, this isn't ideal that they lose, they trade this on the back line. Can we we'll have a quick glance? We'll see. We'll see why... What's it called? Time. Why Lastro dies here. Um, typically if a ball is allowed to get these types of slams, our Zen will die. Uh, but we'll have it. It's because the D.Va closes in and fights, but then also like you're not really looking for your D.Va to help you in this. Hmm. Like theoretically, um... We'll think, we'll think. Theoretically, you're fine doing this as the backline. My issue with the backline really is that they just sit here for like 20 seconds, right? Um, if we go back a little bit. So like, if you're standing there for 20 seconds, you see they're in like basically the same position. It's not like a terrible position. Obviously you have, you know, you have cover, you have places to play. But it makes it very, very easy for the enemy team to set up on you. Like, like this Sombra, this, um, Sombra, you know, Tracer, Diva, Ball, like they're all scouting you for like 10 seconds and they know exactly where you are. Is there any need for you to stand here and just wait for this dive to happen? No. Again, it's like, if we don't have a way of stopping these players staging for us, then we might have had some chances to go for right clicks and so on. I'm not really talking about that, you know. I'm more talking about, you know, why why wasn't Faith in a position to not Faith, sorry. Why wasn't um Anson J in a position to, you know, boop the ball, boop the tracer, get anyone assisting with this dive out of there, right? Similarly, if we're thinking about the kind of macro of this unit here, again we don't want them just standing still, we want them pushing in. Yeah. If we know that these these players are being engaged on. There's not really anything stopping us from pushing forward with this unit. And although it might seem like we're getting dived in a more awkward position, it's always better to, you know, push and force that enemy dive onto us, right? Whereas if we're just standing there letting these players set up, obviously they're gonna have enough players to kill us regardless of what we have. Yeah. So again, it's like if we I don't wanna keep going back too much, but I just wanna see what what the brig's doing. Um like in the run up to this dive, right? She's just kind of looking like she's not doing nothing, right? Because she's playing so close to the Zen and they're all just kind of stacked up. Because she's playing so close, she can't see anything. She has absolutely no info. Yeah? And for a break to do anything, she has to have info. Like this here, where she hears the ball about to slam on the team. This is the first she knows of this wrecking ball. And like that shouldn't be the case. Yeah? Like there's not there's nothing stopping them from playing like a little bit further spread out, right? You now break and play here or here. She can keep an eye out for the Wrecking Ball. You know, the Diva can keep an eye out for the ball as well and, and shout for it. Our Zen doesn't have to be hiding here. He can be, you know, walking towards the Sombra trying to fight it. Yeah? Because he's going to do that. He's going to get the packs. He's going he's gonna to get the Matrix. Like, we, we, we don't want to sit here staying passive until the dive comes in. We have to look for ways to disrupt it. Yeah? So our break has got to come forward, hit whip shots. You know, ideally on the Wrecking Ball or the Tracer. Yeah? Our Diva's got to come forward, support our Zen. When our Zen is, you know, walking on people trying to duel them. You know, we don't want to be standing still. Because we're standing still, our brig doesn't find stuns and boops before the critical moment. And the critical moment is obviously when our Zen gets pile drivered. Yeah? So, again, this backline unit, they have opportunities. They have opportunities to stop this happening. Again, we look at the weather plan. Do we want them hiding like this? No. They're playing on defense. They're the defending team. Which means it's more difficult for these backline heroes to get LOS. So why is this backline hiding? Yeah? Why are these players allowed to stage on this then? They shouldn't be, right? So the options they have, obviously, scout the divers better, make sure we're looking for, you know, aggressive plays, you know, walking onto them with Zen, walking onto them with Brig, Diva flying towards them, right? Mostly our Zen's gonna walk towards them and he's gonna get Matrix, he's gonna get Pax. Uh, or the other option they have is actually to, you know, push forward, keep rotating, right? Because if you keep rotating, you know, the, you know the enemy team are right side, you know you're defending, you know you can take a fight, you rotate towards them, it makes it more awkward for these flanking heroes to actually stage a dive on you, just because you're moving, yeah? Um, and also, like, again, you have these positions you can kind of stabilize and run away to, if when you do get dived. So we have a kind of a messy fight. 
And now we're going to see what happens on the contest while we're waiting for the team to come back. Um, big fan of this EMP. Big fan of the France too. Again, we like to see the commitment. Is there a reason for us to go for these backline plays as a spy here? No, not really. Right. Um, again, we're thinking about the position the team's in. If he sees a chance to go for the pulse bomb, obviously he should go for it. Right. But right now, all the team's really trying to do is take a reset. Oh, sorry. Use the trance to like reset their health balls. And try and keep contestant point. Like, we're not really looking to, like, dive onto the enemy backline just yet, right? We will in about two seconds, three seconds, as soon as we have our ball out of hack. As soon as we have our health loss back, have our cooldowns back. As soon as our Strombro starts to run in, gets ready to set up, right? So, like, a spy doesn't have to wait too long, yeah? Doesn't have to wait too long before he tries to go on the backline. Um, but doesn't need to go for it just yet, right? Because, again, like, and the most important thing, really, yeah, and, like, he dies for it as well. So it's like, the most important thing really is matching the timings. Um, if he's not matching the timings, he's not doing his job. So again, what are we looking for? We're looking at the back line, we're looking to see how they rotate. Again, we're not really expecting to have big engagements at the start of fights with these comps. We're looking at this kind of early skirmish phase, where both, where kind of the flanking units, they're probably both getting forced out like once, twice maybe, um, before we see kind of a full commitment. Especially uh, in the previous fight, we have so many ults used. What I would like to see from Uprising is them try and build a play around the Rally, though, yeah? So, like, we know we're coming up to EMP, we know we have Rally, two very good ults for pushing in, right? So we want to see them set up that play, you know, try and push in, try and get those kills. Before the fight lasts so long, that Define are able to build their own ults, yeah? Uh, again, he's just getting caught. Is there a reason that he's, is there a reason he's just here? I don't know. Have a quick look. He got scattered. He comes out to try and hack the ball. I, I, who knows why? Who knows why? Um, again, there's no pressure on him at this stage of the fight to do anything other than just kind of hover with the team, count with the team, maybe get some damage on the flanks, but he doesn't need to be, you know, coming behind farming MP at this point, right? Because again, it's like, what are we talking about? We had this little skirmish here where both teams used cooldowns, both teams got tagged, you know, the Sombra was forced out, this ball got tagged a half. Their own ball got tagged a half, right? I'm pretty sure recalls like kind of went from both teams as well. How long is it going to take before teams ready to push in? Not very long, right? Are we close to EM Are we so close to EMP that we need you know five percent ult charge? No, right? So like I don't know why he's uncloaking so early. I don't know why he's in this position to be honest. Like if he wants to spam for EMP, there's nothing stopping him just kind of doing it from here and spam with the team. But because he knows that, again, his team's going to be ready to engage in literally just two or three seconds as soon as his tracer gets cleared, it's much more it's much more valuable for him just to set up and be ready, right, for his team to come in. Be ready on that off angle. Be scouting where this backline is, yeah? Or be in a position to get this hack as his team pushes in. Because, again, if he, gets this, if he does this, exactly what he's doing here, as his team is pushing in, then it's fine, right? Because the enemy team won't be able to all turn around and focus him. But because he does it, you know, so early, before his team's ready to push, um, he dies, right? He gets for he either gets forced out or he dies. And obviously in this situation he dies, not ideal. Um, but again, no pressure on him to go for it that early. So like, I don't know if there's some sort of issue in the comms with Defiant that means that we're seeing our flankers kind of consistently going at the wrong time. Um, but it's not ideal so far. We get, we get a nice trance, but we don't we don't use it. We just kind of sit there afterwards. I don't really know why. Um, like as soon as we use this trance, I know it gets forced defensively because the MP. But there's no reason we shouldn't look for a kind of rotation again. Like this isn't a place that we want to be. You know, we have no roof over our head. We have this cover here, but that's it. Um, like it's much better if we use that trance. The enemy team go back. Maybe we rotate main. You know, maybe we try and take point control. And that's kind of what the flankers are doing, but whenever the flankers are doing something, we, we need our backline to be doing something at the same time. Yeah. Again, it is first map. So again, like, uh, is, is Lashra going to survive? I don't know. Like, we'll see in a sec. But the point is, he used Trance here for the first DMP, and he's still here five seconds later. Why? There's no reason for it. Yeah. And again, like, we saw the same thing happen in the first fight, where they're playing on point and get dived. We want to see this backline rotating around constantly. Whenever the Zen... Feels like he does. Whenever the Zen doesn't have people on the screen to shoot, he needs to be commanding this backline unit 
to be rotating. You have to be finding him a new position to be setting him up where he can carry the fight. Yeah. So the fact that he's not doing that and just standing here waiting for the next ult to come in isn't ideal, right? Meanwhile, the rest of his team fighting on point, and once again, a spy has been caught. I'm not. I'm not going to bother, you know, going and finding out whether it was the spy's fault. The fact is, his team had the tempo control after that failed EMP, right? The EMP failed. The trance was out. Yeah. Why are we not pushing forward? Why are we not looking for something to do? And again, Anson J, what eighty five percent, eighty five percent to rally. He's not going to be. He's not going to need to be in the fight for very long before he has this rally. So, so why are we not seeing them walk forward? Yeah. Especially in this kind of last fight situation, we don't want to be stuck here at ninety percent. So again, I don't know why this back. I don't know why backlines playing so passive when they have the ults to let them walk forward. Yeah. All it's meaning is that our flankers, you know, the ball, Tracer, Sombra. They've all been isolated, right? Just because our backline isn't willing to rotate, isn't willing to make plays. Like, we've got to go back and see that. Because again, same thing happens in the first fight, right? Enemy team comes in, they set up the EMP, set up the rally. Again, that's what we wanted to see. It's very good they went for it, right? We can see um, Faith here rotating super close to the rally, calling to his team, let's go, let's go, let's go. EMP comes in. Nice um, trance from Lastra. Now... Why do we not see them walk forward? Why do we see them just sustain in this position instead of rotating? And again, it's, it's not, I'm not saying it's, you know, I'm not saying Define didn't realize it. I'm saying Define didn't call it, you know? Lastro here, we can see him kind of looking at main and sure, he's a Zen player. He wants to go in. He wants to fight. He wants to chase down this, this wrecking ball and fight him. But the fact is, if he's not confident enough, if he's not controlling this backline unit as the flex support player, not telling them where to go, telling them to take him to a better position where he can fight, then they're never going to get anything done with this comp, right? So it's really pathetic, actually, so far, seeing what this backline's done. And they've done nothing. Because as soon as they take any pressure, what do they do? They group up together, they stand still, they wait for the next ult to come in, which isn't what we want to see. We want to see them pushing, we want to see them rotating. You know, we want our Zen to be kicking people to death, because, you know, again, that is how the comp is played, right? So, not very happy so far. And... Because again, what like what is Lasher doing here? He's standing still. We we see a diva bomb. Why do we see a diva bomb? Why is the diva bomb coming from here instead of the team rotating forward and then diva bombing from here? No reason for it, right? It's only because they're they they're playing too passive. They're not recognizing the options they have to make aggressive rotations. Yeah, and that is really the most critical thing at this level of Overwatch. Is you need to recognize those opportunities in that time period that you have of only you know one or two seconds when you have the trance. You have the trance active, and the rest of the team's running back. So I hope that makes sense. Um, I hope that makes sense. And we can see, because the team doesn't push forward, I'm going to keep talking about it, because the team doesn't push forward, we see our flankers get isolated. Yeah, And because we don't have the backline following up when our flankers are going in, our, um, our flankers get isolated, our flankers die. Yeah, So Aspire's death, maybe he could have stopped the hack, I don't know. I'm not going to blame that on him. I'm going to blame it on the fact that backline wasn't ready to push. And again, when you're so close to rally as well, you don't want to be playing at the back, you want to be going in. So, I don't know who's responsible for this in Toronto's backline. I don't know who's responsible for it. But the fact it's happened, you know, more than once on this first round is is just pathetic. Yeah. Um, remember as well, we're also still, with this comp, looking to looking for our Zen and, and our break to walk in. So if we still make those same pathetic mistakes from last round, Whereas Zen is just sitting at the back, waiting for the next, waiting for the next ult to come in. Um, like we're not gonna see Defiant close out. Yeah. Like as soon as the team starts to commit to a dive, again we need this backline to come in. If our brig isn't, you know, mealing people to death, we are gonna struggle. Yeah. And also she's never gonna get any um, rally charge. We'll see, Aspire's dying again. I don't know if this guy's just on ping today, but like he's 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 dying in a lot of these situations, right? And like you're losing a very critical part of the uh, like the flankers. Like if you're not able to keep the enemy team together with the tracer, and they start to spread out, then you have a very very difficult time, right? Because if the enemy team start to spread out, then they're able to stop the staging. You know they're able to get boops on the wrecking balls he's coming in. You know they're able to you know do damage to the sombra as she comes out of cloak and push her out straight away. And if uh, uprising is able to do that. Define and never going to have a chance, right? So when you keep losing traces early on like this, it means that you don't have that ability to keep the enemy team clumped up. And again, like you want the enemy team clumped up because it lets you spam, lets you build the ults faster, lets your Zen especially know exactly how close he can get to the enemy team, right? 
If your Zen sees the enemy team grouped up as six, he knows exactly where he can play. He knows exactly what he can do. And again, Zen, pretty much the most critical hero to winning with this comp, right? You need his damage. You need his discords. You need him walking into closeout fights, right? So again, if you keep losing, if you keep losing the tracer early, you can't keep the enemy team clumped up. That's where you start to struggle. Um, it's fine that they lose the contest here. It's not really an issue. They're happy to lose first fight, right? As long as they have the ults. Because again, like they're not going to commit to a fight until they have the opportunity, which usually means the ults. But if they didn't have the ults before the point capped, not, not a massive issue, right? Uh, so we see another TP. Yeah, it works. Last has just got himself caught in a terrible position again. Um, see what he actually does when the mines come in. Let's get back a little bit further. We'll see what actually does when the mines come in, because again, like this is, we're looking for constant comms from Define about the ult charge. Ah, they rotate under, and he gets walled in. That's a, that's a genius wall. I like that one. Keeps him there for so long too. Um, this isn't really a position that Lastra wants to be in. I don't know what, I don't know how he's ended up here or what he's really doing here, because he needs to be in a position where he can rotate away from the enemy team. The position he's in, he's he's in a literal corner, right? He literally is has got himself caught in the corner. Right, the mail comes across here, and he's in the corner, which should never happen. He always needs to in a needs to be in a position where he can kite out. If he's in a position, you know, even just here at the bottom of the stairs, and he gets pushed by the enemy team, you know, maybe they, you know, speed us onto him, maybe they TP behind. Fact is, he'll be able to run away. And even if he does end up dying, if he can keep the enemy team chasing after him for you know three or four seconds, usually it's going to be enough time for a counter slam to come in, tracer to hit the flank, sombra to come up, and even if he does die, the rest of the team has a good chance of trading out on him. Right. How he's got himself caught, caught in this corner, we have to see. Um, because again, after the find is such a good job, he just kind of runs on point here. I don't know what he's, I don't know why he's playing such a wide angle to begin with. A lot of this play we can actually put on the back of Myungbong because again, with this Ryan comp, how do we play versus a team that is always flanking, always staging, always building ults, always coming in, going out? The way we win. It's by disrupting that in any way possible. The way we disrupt it is just by being ruthless. Yeah. As soon as we see an opportunity to get a kill, you know, like the headshot on like the headshot on the tracer when it comes around here, right? As soon as we have an opportunity to catch an enemy, we commit everything we have to do it. Yeah. So as soon as Lastro commits to this position, and as soon as Myungbom builds his ult, he pulls it straight away. He tries to get the kill, and you know that's exactly what we're looking for. Yeah. And it doesn't matter that he doesn't close out the kill here. The fact is that if you're going for these type of tempo control and plays, like that's how you win against these comps. And like I'm writing a video about this now. Hopefully, it's going to come out in the next couple of days about this thing called like the passive advantage in comp matchups, right? And the passive advantage is just like if a fight goes on for a super long time, and, you know, both teams are playing kind of passively. You know, one team comp usually is going to have the advantage, right? Obviously, in this situation, we can imagine you know if the fight's going on for a long time, neither team is like fully committing, then define. They're probably going to have the advantage. Yeah, the Sombra's going to go in and out. Tracer's going to go in and out. Ball's going to go in and out. Ben's going to be spamming. They're going to be building ults, especially, and then eventually, at some point, you know, they're just going to kind of win through spam or win through the fact they built the ults, right? Whereas with uprising's comp, if the fight lasts a long time, they don't they don't really have anything. Yeah, they have you know May and Bath kind of shooting, but they would have to actually push on someone to kill them, right? So. We can see in this situation that Defiant have the passive advantage. How do you play against a passive ad passive advantage? Oh, sorry. Yeah, how do you play when you're at a passive disadvantage? You play by making plays around tempo. You play by playing for a tempo advantage to make up for the disadvantage you have in this kind of passive comp aspect. And the best way for a Ryan comp to do that is by using an ult ruthlessly whenever you see an enemy out of position. Yeah, which means you might play here. You might suddenly speed this round and try and catch a tracer. You know, if you're playing Kreeze, it means they're hiding on corners and trying to flashbang players as they come around. If you're if you're playing Bat and you have window, it means as soon as you see an enemy out of cover, you're committing that window, you're trying to kill them. Yeah. And if you're controlling the tempo in that manner, not only is it going to give you great chances of getting kills like these, but it's also going to massively slow down how the enemy team are playing, which means they're getting their picks slower, they're building their ults slower, and no longer are you at so much of a passive disadvantage, right? So like that's that's what we're trying to see Uprising do, and that's exactly what this back window does. So 
It's not just a backland off, right? It's a it's a tempo control in play that makes up for the fact that the longer the fight lasts, the bigger the advantage that Defiant have, right? So very, very good from Yongbong. Even though it doesn't get this kill, I just wanted to make it clear that like this is the type of playstyle that we're looking for. Yeah. Um Sin swaps from Uprising, very good swaps, very happy with these swaps. Again, what we, what we're talking about before, uh, in the sense that we're trying to disrupt staging. Yeah, we're not allowing the enemy team to come in and dive. We're trying to stop them, you know, before they even have a chance to dive. Right. The swaps that we're seeing, very very good. Right. Because our Cree, he's going to be able to play on corners, go around, surprise people, flashbang traces. Right. Um. And same goes for the Torb. Our Torb can commit on an angle. He can use his turret to stop a flank, while he's playing close by with the uh, with the molten core. And also now the only super squishy player on the team is the Kree. Sorry, like from the supports POV, the only super squishy player on the team is the Kree. So now it's much, much easier for, Myung, for the supports to keep people alive, right? Because Myungbong only really has the Kree to focus on. Because for the most part, the Torb is going to be able to look after himself. Yeah. So very, very good. It means that no longer is our, is our Batiste super stressed out trying to keep the whole team alive. Mm. Brilliant. Okay, this really, really good showcase here, right? I, I actually, we'll, we'll, we'll play it here. See what happens with the creep. Does he hit the flashbang? Okay, it doesn't. But all right. So we're talking about the swap to tour. We're talking about why the swap is good. Because what are we trying to do with this comp? We're trying to disrupt the staging before the dive happens. Yeah. And even though the torp doesn't really do anything, I want you to focus on how much value we get out of this turret. Right? Look at this turret here. What does this turret do? It means that when a dive comes in with with the slam, with the mines, where are the flankers? They're busy dealing with the turret. Right? So instead of our tracer blinking in with pulse, our sombra coming in doing the damage, looking for the hacks, right? We've you know disrupted that dive, we've disrupted their staging. And all we've done for it Sorry, all we've done for it is pick Torb and put the turret down. So again, we can see how these tiny little swaps can actually do so much, right? So like this this fight, this dive was survived purely because of this turret, yeah? Just because it's delayed the flank of these two heroes. So that's what we're trying to do. That's how we're trying to disrupt stage, yeah? We're not sitting at the back and expecting to just survive a dive. We're stopping the dive from having as much power as it did previously, yeah? So again, very good from our pricing so far. Okay, so. We have a little bit more of Briggs and Mirror. We've talked quite a lot about Briggs and Mirror, so I don't want to. I might skim through this last round, and then look at um, and then look at what's it called? Uh, control, not control. Two CP. Let's see if we have any other kind of interesting comps. Full mirrors. Yeah. Okay. Is uprising in a better position, probably. Yeah. Again, it's like if you can like with the first round, we're talking about positions we can leapfrog from, right? So like where does uprising supports go? They start here, they go in here, now they can go here, now they can go here, now they can go here. Yeah. And again, every position they guard a little piece of cover they can play around. Right? Whereas because Defiant didn't win the fight for this area here with the Mega, where are the supports forced to play? They're forced to play here, right? Which means they have no cover. There's nowhere they can leapfrog from. They're forced to go onto point or like behind point, where they don't really have any cover. And they have to kind of stay in the same position. Yeah. So again, like that's why taking control of these early positions is so good, because it gives you so much freedom to kind of leapfrog from cover to cover, like while you're pushing forward. Yeah. Whereas because uprising don't have any cover if they play here, they're forced to run away to point. Right. Um, and again, if they're playing on point, it means their flankers can't really play top. They should commit and stand the stairs, which we should see them die for. Maybe. Um, instead, we see a spy die because I assume Stan Wong gets booped. We sh really shouldn't be seeing. Oh, sorry, instead, we see Myung Wong die in the back line, which we really shouldn't see. Um, like, what we should see is these two players walking forward. They should recognize they have an advantage because they had the space. They should recognize that the enemy team are playing in a. F fucking terrible position and that they have a chance just to walk onto them right again like we talked a little bit in like the last video 
about we had the example with the zen right where the zen's like dying in the back line if you're playing zen in this comp you do not get peel you do not get help you do not get matrix you get nothing if you play at the back right if your team has a chance to push in and you're not following them you cannot expect any help yeah so like if we focus on young boy actually see what happens here like yes he gets discorded yes he gets clipped but why is he playing at the back instead of trying to push in to follow up on this on the slam right like that's the type of stuff we're looking at and if he's doing that what does it mean it means briggs able to heal him again the brig should also be doing the same thing it means briggs able to heal him it means the diva's close enough and is like near sorry it means the diva's close enough that she can turn and matrix them without having to like fully turn around and stop what she's doing yeah she'll be able to react in time to matrix her zen if the zen is pushing with it yeah but like there's no reason for this backline not to be trying to follow up on this uh, on this slam here like, I assume he gets booped by the... I assume the... What's it called? Stand 1. The Wrecking Ball gets booped by the Brig, which is the reason why he doesn't get the slam here. Pretty critical he doesn't get the slam. But regardless, we should have had the supports pushing in. Because again, like, what would we have had if we had the supports pushing in? Right? If we go back a couple seconds. We'd have had a really, really nice fight. Because what we would have had... You see balls coming top with the D.Va. Both, both DPS plan point. If this... Sorry. If this boop didn't happen... Right? We'd have Slam coming this way, DPS coming this way, the ports pushing this way. And there's no way that Defiant would survive. Right? So because we didn't have the supports pushing, because for some reason they're staying at the back, when hopefully the rest of Uprising are, you know, yelling at the top of their voices that it's time to push, you know, we're pushing in, we're pushing in, we're chasing. You know? Because they weren't following up, it's the reason that they don't actually close out these kills. It's the reason that Myungbong dies in the back line. Yeah? So Defiant had just clutched the fight out of nowhere because the, because uh, Uprising supports didn't want to push. This is a fun comp, actually. I like this one a lot. I, I feel like it's best when you have strong heroes in backline. Well, I say strong heroes, but I feel like it's best when you have heroes like Ash and stuff in backline. Right? So I'm talking about this comp here. Like, I feel like it's best when you're playing against kind of Ash, you know, Hanzo... Like, maybe Arissa as well, to an extent, like... When you have a chance to kind of flank around, you know, use the speed boost, use the matrix to flank around the map, then, you know, TP in the Reaper, dive in with in the front with Anna and Monkey and all that. I don't know if I would want to play it here. Just because, like, it's very reliant on Monkey Bubble and uh, Reaper Shift, yeah? So if if you don't get a good enough advantage in the fight before your Reaper Shift and your Monkey Bubble runs out, you're going to get pushed out, you're going to be in serious trouble, right? Whereas when we look at Uprising Comp, what do they have? They have Bat Brick, right? They have Torb. I know they just swapped, but like they have Torb. They have Ryan, you know, they have they have Diva, they have Kree. They have heroes that can stay alive for a really, really long time. They can easily stay alive long enough to f to break a monkey bubble and to force a Reaper Shift, right? So I, I don't... We'll see. We'll see how this goes, but I, this isn't probably isn't what I'd pick. Um... We'll see, we'll see. Maybe it'll work pretty well. If they can stage a good enough dive, it will work well. Again, nice place from... Um, <laughs> nice boop. Uh, nice place from Uprising. What are, we doing? what are we doing with this comp? Again, we're looking to ruthlessly catch enemy any enemies before they manage to set up. Yeah. If we allow them to come in and make their dives, then we're going to have a difficult fight. Whereas if we're able to look for shadows, look for stuns, you know, look for tall bolts or back windows early before the enemy team set up, then we're going to win fights. Yeah. So again, very good. Because again, it's like we want to force out the nano here. We want to. We want this nano to be half health. We want this. We want this nano to come out now. We don't want it to come out where the enemy nano she's here with full health, walking to point, and the monkey's diving in with full health with the nano there. Right. So even though the shadow doesn't directly turn into anything, what it does is it forces the ults out here, which gives uprising a chance. What do they? Gives them a chance to back up, take another fight on point. You know, so they're not immediately dying to defiance to defiance. Uh, what's it called? Uh, dive, right? Again, if you start the fight early, it means that the tracer is no longer on the flank. You know, the tracer doesn't have time to set up a flank if you're pushing in and shattering her team. So now she's got to engage frontally from main instead of hitting an off angle at the same time as her monkey dives in. Right? So I hope that makes sense. Um, so very very good for uprising to look for those types of players. So Nano with the primal, with a nice window, with the tall turret shooting through the window. 
very, very happy here. Very, very good fight. Again, I don't really know what the fight think they can do with this comp. Um, finally, they make a swap to a better comp. <laughs> I don't know what they were doing last fight. Um, if they're just trying to get use out of the nano and the primal, which is is fair enough. If I'm playing the same comp on defense, which I'm not crazy about. Um, yeah, it's like uprising's comp is good. It's good versus this. If they can get these rotations and start building the support ults, they should be fine. What are we trying to do here? We're, hopefully we're scouting. Hopefully we know where the enemy monkey is. Hopefully what we're not going to do is try and immediately dive onto the enemy backline. Because if we see that, then we'll know that something's gone wrong. Okay, so we know something's gone wrong. Do we want our backline to get caressed by the enemy monkey, the enemy flankers, as we're walking through? No. Why, for any reason, would we want to try and dive with this comp? Right? It's a first fight situation. We have literally no ults. We're like 10% in. Why, for any reason, would we be trying to dive the backline? I. It doesn't make sense to me. I'd like. There must be someone. There must be some clear-headed voice on this team that's able to tell them this isn't what they're looking for. Like, we we we're not just diving for the sake of diving. You know, if we're diving with this comp, if we're pushing onto the backline, it means we have the ult and we have some sort of off angle. There's no other reason, right? In a first fight situation, when we're playing against a Brig and an Anna that are in one of the strongest positions in the map, there's absolutely no reason for us to push, right? So it really doesn't make sense to me. There is nothing at all stopping this team from doing a little bit of a scout, finding out where the enemy team are. This is basically the most common position for Winston you could ever play in this map, right? If you're coming out there this way. There's nothing stopping us walking out in this monkey, dropping a bubble so we don't care about any nades, don't care about any damage from Echo, and pushing the monkey out straight away, right? He's not going to get any healing because we, we've got the bubble, we have the matrix, right? And most importantly, because all we're using is speed boost and matrix to get out, we still have our jump cooldowns. We still have the monkey jump. We still have the, the diva shift, right? So that if it goes terribly and the whole team gets handied, we can still jump away. More likely what will happen is we'll come out in the corner, hit the monkey, monkey will jump back, and then we can chase him because we still have the jump cooldowns, right? This is... One of the most simple comps in the world to play if you understand how to do it. I don't know why no one has told this team that this is just not what you're looking for, right? Like, these guys scrim like six hours a day. I, I don't know, this this doesn't make sense to me. Like, this is a very, very simple thing to understand. You have an Echo as well. You have a great hero that can come up through this left window and even get an off angle on this push, right? It doesn't take much to know that this is one of the most common monkey positions and all you need to do when you're playing the Reaper is to walk out and shoot him. If we were playing an Ana comp, if we were playing Ana Brig, fine. Monkey dives here, rest of the team focuses the monkey, but we're not. We're playing we're playing uh, Lucio Mora, right? Which is a very, very different comp. We're using Matrix, maybe speed boost to close distance, hitting the monkey, using the bubble here, and then we still have the jump cooldown so we can chase or we can run away. Very, very simple. I, I feel like every time I see this comp, I have to explain the whole thing because we're seeing these types of plays that don't make sense. Because now what do we see? We see... Diva, Monkey, Tracer, all, you know, massaging our backline as we're pushing, yeah? Would this Ana, this Brig, this Echo threatened at any point? No. So, I, I don't know, it doesn't make sense to me. I don't like it. I hate it when I see teams do this. I hate it when I see teams make these fundamental mistakes based on how comps are playing, right? Because, like, this is the type of shit you expect from fucking, like, tier 3 scrims, right? Again, what happens? Our Moro fate is forced, you know? Our Lucio is getting hard-focused, our Diva's getting slapped. It's so easy for the enemy team because all we've done is gone in a single direction, six players, oh yeah, let's go in and we'll plan dive, you know? So again, it doesn't make sense to me. Surely there's someone on this team that can, that can say, hey, let's not try and dive straight in, let's try and fight over here. They managed to get these two kills just because Echo's OP. Hey, like they might even win off this, but I don't care, right? The fact is that it's just a horrendous way to make this engage. And if... Um, if the fight were better, this wouldn't have happened. Like there's no reason that this Echo gets this flank, yeah? Like, I, I need to see how this Echo gets these kills. Because like, it's, it just shouldn't happen. Like, I can only shoot in the brig, like, wasn't watching or something. Like, this is just ridiculous. Like, do, do they surely they understand there's two doors, right? Surely they understand there's two doors into the position they're playing. Like, why is no one looking behind? I don't know. So. And great. As soon as Valent, as soon as uh, Nice gets tagged with the bombs. What does he do? He shifts directly into his brick. So, all right. I I don't know. I, I hate this. This is this is just awful. Like from both teams. Angry, angry. What do we see? We see one team 
not understand how a compass plays and basically lose the fight because of it. And then we see that same team clutch out a fight because the other team doesn't understand the position they're holding has two doorways. Yeah. We'll look at a few more fights. Again, I don't want to waste too much time. I want to have a quick look at the last round. Um... Right. What are we seeing here? We're seeing a team intent. So the other tool that this team has, right? So again, because they're playing the Lucio Mario, same as we were talking on first point. What they can do is they can walk in using nothing but a bit of matrix and maybe a speed boost and start a little fight. Start a little fight. Not a major one. They're not going to commit anything. No ults, you know, nothing serious. But they're going to start a little fight. What's going to happen? Enemy team plan defense is the enemy team is going to pull everything into this fight. They're going to see the enemy team coming in. They're going to be like, right, now's the time to use nano. Now's the time to use copy, right? Now's the time to, you know, maybe diva bomb them or rally them as they're walking in. Yeah. And then when that happens, what do we have? We still have those jump cooldowns. Yeah. We still have the reaper shift, the echo, dot, the echo shift. Well, we probably won't have the echo shift, but mo mostly the tank ults we're talking about. Yeah. So what it means is when those ults come in, we can still get out. And then we can just chill, wait for those ults to run out, then go back in. Yeah. So this comp is able to do that. They're not focused on going all the way in. They're focused on kind of skirmishing around, baiting the enemy team, running away. And then once those enemies have been baited and those ults been been used and timed out, then we can see them go back in and take a real fight. Yeah. What we're not looking for, surprising, running straight in, jumping straight to the back of the map. Yeah. There's a very important difference between those two playstyles. Because again, like, what do we see happen? Yeah, we see as soon as the team starts pushing in, the nano comes out. Sado's ready to he's, he's ready to rumble. You know, we could have forced this nano just by walking in with a bit of matrix and maybe a speed boost. Yeah, and when that happens, when that nano gets forced, again, this team has a massive potential just to jump out. So why are they not taking it? Who knows? Well, I, I mean, I know it's because they don't understand how to play the comp, and we could see that on first point. So, again, like, what are we seeing? So now, like, again, the rally's out too. Could we have forced this rally without the monkey jumping in? Maybe, maybe not. Do we care too much? No. The monkey can jump in because he's got primal. But the fact of the matter is, if we're walking in with a bit of matrix, with a bit of speed boost maybe, we still have the jump cooldowns we get out. You know, it doesn't matter how many times I keep saying it. Yeah? It's the same idea. You know, these ults could have been forced without committing. And then all we do is we leave, we wait, and then we go back in. Yeah? And we do that enough times until we have enough ults to win a fight engaged. while the enemy team's ults are really wasted. Yeah? Instead, what are, we, what are we doing? We're using it all, you know? Lucio's already dead, but hey, let's have, let's, you know, let's use copy, let's use fucking primal and um, what's it called? This one, Death Blossom, right? This comp is fantastic at playing around ults because it's very easy to force enemy ults and it's very quick to build your own ults, right? What we don't want to do is see them jump in and trade all of their ults, all of their good ults, for a rally and a nano, right? Like, this, this isn't a good situation for Uprising to be in. Yeah? And again, they just get, they just get annihilated. So, I don't know, it really, again, it's like pathetic, right? Almost as pathetic as seeing, you know, Lastro cower basically in spawn on that first map, right? Like, we want to see them playing these comps correctly. And the fact that this comp, which... Pretty much every team should have played at some point and only really takes like a week maybe to learn of scrims, you know, especially for an Overwatch League team. I don't know why they're not able to play this, but they're not able to play it properly. They have a very, very good comp for this matchup too, right? Any other team playing, well, not any other team, but most other teams playing this comp would have been able to deal with the fine at some point. So again, this comp is quite easy to play. Well, sorry, it's, it has a lot of, it has quite a big safety net just because it does build so many ults. So we can see that even though they screwed up last fight so much, they're still pushing with Coalescence, Down Barrier, Diva Bomb, right? So we'll see what happens. So come up, man. This is good. This is good because what are we doing? We're walking out. We're not diving. We're walking out, forcing an enemy ult. Again, happy with that. Winston. Now we can back up. Again, coal relatively cheap. We don't care really that we used it for this first skirmish, right? So maybe someone finally has woken up on, on Uprising. They've said, right, guys, focus. We're not trying to die. We're trying to, you know, force the enemy first. We're trying to take little brawls. We're trying to take the static brawl on the corner and then go back. Yeah. So again, very happy with that. 
Again, coalescence we can use for that because it's relatively cheap. So still happy. Really unlucky you get hit by the pulse bomb. But still, opening of the fight, pretty good. You know, much better than the last one. Please don't commit anything else. We're going to lose. Nice. I want to see them if they actually do win a fight with this comp. Because again, at some point, they will be pushing with so many ults that we would expect them to win a fight. Really unlucky with the with the Tracer Sticky. <sighs> please, please, God. Like, there is no pressure on this team to speed boost in and fight. Like, there is, but not straight away. You know, go in for a little bit. You have a little bit of a fight, you know? As soon as you come in, what's going to happen? A nade's going to come your way, an ult's going to come your way, whatever. And then when that happens, you can just walk away. You have a you have one of the only comps in the game where every single player has an escape, right? Like, what have we got? We've got Fade, we've got Shift, we've got Shift, you know, we've got Bubble as well. We've got, you know, the Shift from the Reaper, the Fly from the Echo. The Echo, you know, she can get caught, sure. But they've all got escapes. You know, the Lucio's got Wall Ride and Boots. Like, every player on this team can get out of sticky situations fairly easily, yeah? Especially if they're playing together and stacking together the support healing, as well as stacking the, the tanks with each other. So we have the Bubbles and we have the Matrix, yeah? So why is there pressure on us to jump straight in like this? When every single time we've done it, we're bleeding picks and we're allowing the enemy team to get huge value out of these ults. We're allowing Sado just to hard farm us by you know, sending you know, five players through his beam every time we're walking in. This doesn't make sense, right? It doesn't make any sense and it, I really hope it's clear to anyone watching this that this is not how you're trying to play these comps. What are you going to do trying to primal a backline in this comp? Nothing. Do you care about what the backline does? No. Who are the players we care about? We care about the Tracer, we care about the Echo. We're playing 2CP, right? So it's the enemy flankers that are dropping on us from main. They're the ones that are stopping us winning fights, not the Anna and the Briggs down live in the backline, right? So it doesn't make, it, so it, it makes no sense to see these players committing. It makes no sense to see a Lucio and a fucking monkey primaling onto an Anna Brig backline, yeah? These aren't free kills. It's going to take us 20 minutes to even get close to killing them. In the meantime, the enemy flankers, you know, and I'm including Diva here, including Monkey here, because we're running straight past him. Those people that we've left in main, they're the ones annihilating our team, right? So, like, I, I really hope this is getting across how stupid this is, right? I know this is only play-ins, but this is still play-ins. This is still the people, like, trying to get into the playoffs of the Overwatch League. So, like, I don't know why we're seeing such, like, fundamental mistakes in the way these comps are played. Uh, okay. So, fight here, what are we looking at? Uprising, no alts, fine. They got the rally, which is kind of the most important thing. So what are we looking for? We're looking for a little skirmish in main. A little skirmish, not really much going on, just a little fight in main. And then as soon as Paolo gets to this corner, we want both teams to understand that when Paolo gets to this corner, or it's like just come around this corner, that is when the fight's happening. The fight is going to happen in this, well, not necessarily in this area, but when the payload is in this area, right? So what we want, we want our Wrecking Ball, our Tracer, our Sombra, ideally to be set up to take us, take an engage and join the fight, whatever, when payload's in this area. Right now they're not, I don't really know what they're doing. I don't know if Sada's just like scouting or something, but um, we're under, we're in a little bit of trouble just because our DPS aren't set up at the right time. And again, the indicator isn't anything to do with what the enemy team are doing. The indicator is very simple. The indicator is where is the cut? Yeah. Um, so we'll see. Do we see the Zendai? Uh, we should. He does. Cool. So we get that in the back line. What? Kill the Kree, kill the Zen. Fine. It's okay. You know, we, we still get a decent dive. I'm not actually looking at the dive. When we have support ults in the back line, obviously we can afford to go for these types of trades. But again, there wasn't really that much of a need to go for. There wasn't really much of a need to go for a trade, right? We, I'll just go back, just because it might be the last fight where we can actually see this in action. Um, like the way the fight went was fine, but if when Paolo gets to about here, the flankers on defiant are ready to you know do an engage, what it means is the rally can be used to like push forward, right? And instead of having a situation where we have, you know, these players fighting out the back, and then these players fighting over here, we have kind of two different fights. We have the whole of Defiant using the rally, using the dive to push in and try and fight. Yeah. 
Whereas instead, because we go at slightly different timings, it's kind of a little bit, a little bit messier. And even though it works fine, you know, even though like the Kree gets discorded, we fly in and kill him. I think we hit this pulse on the Zen in a sec. Even though it works fine, it's a little bit too messy for my liking, right? Um, and again, like when we're looking at uprising, do we want our Zen, our break to be here? No. Are they gonna get? Are they gonna get Matrix? Are they gonna be able to help Kree stay alive? No. If they were pushing soon as the slam starts coming in then they have a much better chance and again the slam coming in and then pushing what it does is it forces the rally out here yeah and because it forces the rally out here if uprising wanted to as soon as they saw that rally they could turn around and run away right so again like we don't want our support sitting at the back we want our supports poised to push in even if they end up turning around and running away the fact that they're ready to push in is going to force the enemy team to use resources here right instead of allowing them to walk forward and use and use their resources kind of over here, right? So that's the kind of thing that we want from both teams that fight. We want, as soon as Pell gets here, the fight to realize, oh, we need to fight. So we want the flankers to be ready to take a fight over here once, once Pell gets there, right? Instead, we see them go for it late, go for the back line. Luckily, they get the trades, but it's not a clean fight. Yeah, it's not quite what we're looking for. Um, and again, classic thing from Uprising. Supports do not want to be at the back. Supports need to be pushing in. We're not getting healing. We're not getting peel. We're not able to help our team get kills if we're playing at the back. Yeah? Please. Most of the interesting stuff from this VOD is kind of it's kind of that first map where we're looking at the, the non-mirror matchups with the Rhine and where we're looking at like the way that Lastro and, and Sunjay are playing and like they're not trying to push and stuff. So this is great. We like this, right? We like this type of position. Usually it would be too aggressive, but because we have the trance, we're very happy with this, yeah? Because we can play here, make the enemy think, oh, nice, we're going to come in and kill them. And then we can negate all of that with the trance, yeah? And because of that, now we force the enemy team to spend, you know, all their time, all their attention looking in this direction. What that means, now the rest of our team has a chance to get kills, yeah? So we'll see how this works out. Hopefully, hopefully we see a trance pulled now before it's too late. Yep. And then at the same time, what do we see? The Tracers drop in, the, uh, the Divas drop in for fights, the Hansers drop in to get arrows. Don't really know why our ball slamming cart, but again, very nice. That's exactly what we're looking for, right? As soon as our ults allow us to take aggressive positions, play aggressively, that's what we're trying to do, yeah? So again, like if we just look at that again quick. Very, very happy with the fight for this fight, right? Because they have the ults that enable them to kind of play outside the default. They have the ults that enable them to play aggressive. They see the opportunity and they take it. Yeah. Um, so again, we can see how this positioning from Astro is just enabled by the fact he has trance. Because he's playing there. Look how many look how many enemies, right? Basically all six players. Like if this Hansa wasn't here, you know, uh, what's it called? Valentine would be helping, probably, maybe. Who knows? But we have five players all looking at them. All that attention ready to be wasted. Just because he has trance, yeah? So, like, that's the type of thing we're trying to do with these support ults. He wasn't waiting at the back, waiting for the team to come in, and then using using his ult defensively, right? That wasn't what he was doing. He was taking an aggressive position, right? He was playing aggressively, and using that ult to enable him to play aggressively, yeah? So, again, like, that's the mindset that we want with support ults. We're not using them to counter what the enemy team's doing. We're not, using them, we're not saving them for enemy ults. We're playing aggressively, forcing enemy options, forcing enemy cooldowns. And then using these ults to either, if it was a rally, we'd use it to push, right? Because it's a trance, we use it to push in, bait the enemy onto us, and then negate all that with the trance. Yeah. So again, it's the best mindset for these support ults, right? So it's nice to see. To, it's nice to see Define actually doing it. If we go back to that Busan at the at the start, where Lastro's sitting miles away, you know, just kind of pathetically spamming from the back line instead of pushing in, right? We can see there's like miles of difference there, right? Okay, because of that, it means that Nice has a very, very easy time dropping behind him that pulse bomb. Yep. So that's the type of mindset that we want to have with these ults, with these support ults. Yep. Yeah, so like we see the reason why we're speaking out using Matrix instead of using the jumps, because it means that when we get to this position, we still have them. I'm 37, he shouldn't have died. I don't know why he didn't have a shift, right? But again, that's the reason why we're using the speed boost, why we're using the Matrix to start off with. So we still have those important cooldowns. You know, shift, shift, shift. 
is shift from the Moira as well. We still have those important cooldowns when the critical moment happens here. So we can use those cooldowns to either commit or run away. Because we're in this hallway, the only real thing we need to do is commit, right? So we see Monkey commit the jump. Anyway. The dive kind of... It works fine. I don't want to go in the micro of why players are dying. Like, let's just assume that was all the stuff in micro. The way they set up, even though they bled a couple of picks, it was so much better than what we saw on Anubis, right? It was so much better. Um, so again, we're very happy with that. And we'll see if they can carry on for the rest of the map. Um, Armor is in a really awkward position here. Okay, so when we're playing this comp, when we're playing this comp, we are looking for a position where we can take what we like to call a static brawl. Okay, so we have a nice chuck here. So let's say that we play here. What this means is that we can play static on the corner and sit there, stack together the healing of our Lucio Mora, stack together our, our tanks as well. So we have four players, you know, tanks, Lucio Mora, all together, right? Usually we don't want to do this. Usually we want to spread out, but not with this comp, right? Because what we're relying on is overlapping Matrix with Bubble and overlapping Mora Heal with Lucio Heal, right? And if we overlap them, what does it mean? We have a fucking shitload of sustain, yeah? And if we have that sustain, Nothing can kill us unless they hard commit, and our supports are building those ults really quick, right? Also what it means is we have a very obvious position where our supports can run to, right? So if our supports take a bit of damage, what do they do? They run in this corner, they get protected, yeah? If we don't have that, what it means is our Mora doesn't build coal very quick. It means our tanks don't get healed straight away. It means our supports are in positions where they can get caught. It means our Mora doesn't know where she should go when the team gets engaged on, which is the reason why Myungbones ended up so far away from the team. Yeah, so we need to have these kind of stabilization positions. We need to have them with this comp. And typically, what will happen is you'll take a position like this. So again, enemy team over here. I'll do uprising in blue, right? So you'll take a position like this. DPS, they don't have to play with you. They're probably going to play split. Maybe the Reaper plays with you, but whatever. Don't don't worry about that too much. Just think about the tanks and the supports, right? So tank supports play them positions like this. Then what's going to happen is at some point. Either the enemy team are trying to come this way and fight you, in which case you're very happy just to stay there and fight, right? Because look, what you've got, you've got tanks, you've got supports on the corner, you've got everything you need to contest this choke. So what the enemy team typically are going to do is they're going to take these flanks. Yeah? They're going to take these flanks, they're going to spread out, and what they're going to do is they're going to set up, they're going to, sorry, I need to do that in red. They're going to take a setup like this. You know, Maybe the ball goes all the way behind, comes around here, right? So what they're doing is they're taking a setup so they can deal with you in this position. So you, again, Lucio Mora, tanks, on this corner. Enemy team, they're going to think, oh, we can't push past them because we're going to get zapped, we're going to get pushed on, whatever, right? So what they do is they flank. They take positions where they can spam you in this position. They're taking a setup. Sorry. They're taking a setup that allows them to deal with you if you play this position, right? But when you see that happen as this team here, when you see them take those positions, when you see them setting up to deal with you, if you're playing in this position... What do you do? That is when you push. That's when you push main, right? Because the enemy team, they've spent all this time, they put all this effort into setting up to deal with you in this position. And as soon as you see them take that setup, then you push, right? And now the enemy team are no longer set up to deal with you. Yeah? Like that's how this comp's trying to play when it's defending chokes, right? I know they were in a kind of awkward position because they didn't have full players when they started defending the choke, but that is the way this team's trying to play. So that's what we want to see them try and do. We haven't seen them play the... Oh, hopefully we understand how this works, yeah? So when we're defending with this comp, we're taking the static brawl in the corner. Once the enemy team are wasting that time, wasting that attention, setting up to deal with us when we're playing this position here, that's when we push onto the back line, try and kill them, yeah? Again, very, very simple. I don't know if Uprising really had a chance to do it because they were players down, but you can do this with like three people, yeah? Again, like, it doesn't matter the DPS aren't back, right? Because if the team's playing here, ready to static brawl around this post here, that's still enough, yeah? Because again, if the enemy team come around and you feel like you can't stay there, you are still able to jump out. You are still able to escape, right? Lucio maybe might have a bit of trouble because he doesn't have, like, a shift, right? <laughs> Relaunched on my phone, I mean. <laughs> We've restarted it. Um... Like, sure, like, the Lucid doesn't have, like, a shift cooldown the way these other three heroes have, but you can still get out, yeah? So, like, that's what we want to see them do. We don't want to see them spread out. We don't want to see the monkey go top, yeah? 
Because we're not playing a comp that has to deny staging, right? We're playing a comp that wants to turtle up in a position like this. Like, you think this Diva's able to get around the corner if the team's playing here? No. Do you think that the team, if we're playing Lucio, Moira, Diva, um, Winston, do you think they care if a Trace is here? Even if the Trace has Pulse Bomb, we don't care, because we've got the Monkey Bubble, we've got the Diva Matrix, yeah? So, um, like, that's what, that's what we're trying to do. We're not trying to spread out. We're not trying to put monkeys up top, yeah? So, again, very poor to see. They're not really understanding what's going on. Um. Adaptive circuits engaged. Okay. Do we care if they win this fight? Eh, not really. They didn't set up for it too great. Still looking to see them play this Lucio Mora comp a little bit better. Define, on the other hand, are playing fine. You know, like, they're making a few mistakes, but there's nothing critical. Um. The mistakes that they're making are kind of being hidden by the fact that Uprising are just pathetically failing in the way they're playing this comp, right? 